I was working on the Devil Ship Pirates, Don Sharp, lovely man. But on that ship that was built by the studio carpenters instead of shipbuilders, there was something not right with the ballast and the balancing of the ship. Everyone went to the one side of the ship to help up the ladies with the tea and the sandwiches. And because we all went onto this side of the ship, couldn't take us all on one side. It just fell over on its side. Everybody was thrown into the water. I slid across the deck and landed in the corner of the ship. And I remember all the rigging came down on top of me. Only person I could see was Christopher Lee, who managed to clamber up onto the end of the ship. He was hanging on there. He said, I can see all the pirates, all those stuntmen, swimming for their lives, not helping anybody. He then just gave me this commentary and eventually I was rescued, but I was afraid the boat would sink. And then I remember a funny story that a few days later, Tony Keyes visiting us um, and saying that he'd had all these claims. He had to get an insurance claim. And everybody that day lost their wallets in the water, they lost their Parker pens. He said, electricians don't carry Parker pens, but they all did that day. So they put in for Parker pens and and that was quite amusing how in the gold watches all <laughs> they lost. It was a, a happy atmosphere down there because it really felt like filming in a house. So it helped. It wasn't like filming on a set. You somehow felt you were filming in a private house. So you you know you were living it. We can't stay here. We, we must leave this place now. Yes, it, it, darling. It's all right. There's it no... isn't. It isn't. Uh, come, sit down a moment. Charles. Charles, you, you mustn't go upstairs. You mustn't. He's only going to see if there's anyone at home. He'll only be gone a couple of minutes. I'll be back before you know it. Bray Studios were not at all until you got into the actual sound stages, they were nothing like any studio that there has ever been, I don't think. Because it was simply a large country house on the river, and a beautiful one. So much of the work was done in the quadrangle outside it, whereas places like MGM and Pinewood are just huge sound stages with a man in a uniform letting you in, you know. They're just factories. It's pretty rough. We used to go there when we were students. Somebody always gets drunk and starts fighting. Oh, that sounds wonderful. There's a lovely saying, we're given memories so we can have roses in winter. And Christopher, Sir Christopher, and Peter Cushing are my roses in winter because working with both of them was wonderful. Christopher's great sense of humour and lovely singing voice, so we used to have Christopher singing round in the morning with the mist rising in the sound of the water outside, and the adorable Patrick Troughton playing his flute in the dressing room. They were wonderful memories of Hammer. Hammer fans obviously have a great deal of nostalgia for the films that Hammer made at Bray, because really those were visibly the most distinctive. They were a body of work made at a particular studio, and the majority of them looked gorgeous. But really, the people who were running Bray Studios, Hammer Films themselves, didn't have any particular nostalgic feelings for Bray. In fact, it rapidly, in the early 60s, seemed to them rather like a millstone around their necks because it was extremely expensive to run. But Bray had a kind of last hurrah in 65 and 66, brought on by, initially, Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and the three films that were made back to back with that film. They went out as double bills. You had Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and The Plague of the Zombies. And you had Rasputin, The Mad Monk, and The Reptile. Get away! This very warm atmosphere and that great feeling when everybody is working towards the same end, which is the final product, the film itself, and wanting to make it good. They were good days. Hammer had been backpedaling a bit, they'd been treading water a bit, there'd been lots of censorship trouble. The censor had been really difficult with them in the early 60s. They'd cut the Curse of the Werewolf to bits. Their supremacy in the horror stakes was beginning to falter. However, with Dracula, Prince of Darkness and the Plague of the Zombies, they got right back on top.
Ray was lovely. I was sad to leave it. I mean, Ealing, great, and Pinewood. I didn't work much up. I hardly knew Pinewood. But the bigger they get, the more one gets into the whole, the mechanical business of making movies, you know, which if you're a, a real movie buff is, is great. But, you know, as actors, it becomes very mechanical, I find. A car would come and pick me up every morning, which I thought was terribly grand at 21, and take me to the studio. And the early morning drive was wonderful through English countryside, as it was then. The studio was small, I realise now. I think there are only a couple of sound stages. And it was like being in a family, which is always very attractive to an actor. And a lot of the crew had worked together before. We had a wonderful AD on Plague, Bert Batt. I worked with Bert Batt, who came in as first assistant director on a whole string of films. Um, I think the first one was The Evil of Frankenstein that I remember working for Bert. And I love working with Bert because he was, again, I use that word, a disciplinarian, but a very, very good first assistant director, very good floor manager, and knew exactly what was required. He could almost pre-think the director of what shot was next and what had to be done, what wall had to be taken out, which wall had to come in, and various aspects to do with reshaping um, the next shot for that particular scene. When Plague of the Zombies came up, Again, we didn't have any money. And I thought, oh, what on earth is a zombie where I got no idea? And I can remember, I'm not sure how I came up with an idea, but I went down to see Arthur and Stan Banks down in the plaster shop. And I can remember Stan, I don't know whether he was teasing me or not. He said, here, take this roll of scrim. So I took this huge roll of scrim Went back to the wardrobe, and I thought, maybe I can do something with this if I dye it. And I remember having to go see Tony Keyes and saying, can I have a gas thing outside the frock shop and a bucket on the gas thing that I can put dye in and dye all this stuff? And he let me do it. And that's how he came about, making those funny-looking frocks with a scrim from the plaster shop. <laughs> when Tony Hines referred to location work and the fact that he'd like it to be within walking distance of the studio, if at all possible, one particularly marvellous location, which, as Hammer well knew, was just next door to Down Place, was Oakley Court. They knew that well, of course, because they'd worked there themselves in the late 40s. Oakley Court was a fabulous Gothic-looking house. What could be better, given that in 1956 they started making Gothic horror films? And perhaps most notably, they used Oakley Court in both The Plague of the Zombies and The Reptile. And apparently the villain in each case lived in the same Cornish country house. In fact, it was a Berkshire country house and it was Oakley Court. I mean, effectively, these two films appear to be set in the same damn village. Uh, because on this occasion, Bernard Robinson didn't make radical adjustments. These are Cornish villages, which are both constructed, literally, around a sort of square-shaped graveyard, which in classic Hammer style is the very cheery main feature of the village square, is a sunken graveyard around which the villages um, are constructed. And it's the same in both films. It comes as a surprise to find that The Plague of the Zombies is set in somewhere called Carlton, which is rather a dull name, but when you watch the film or read the novelization of The Reptile, you will find that the village there is called Clagmore Heath. Well, okay, they've got different names, but they're the same village, effectively. Very unfortunate village to have a plague of zombies on one occasion, and clearly very soon afterwards, um, a kind of poor girl who's been brought over from Borneo and turns periodically into a killer snake woman. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, these two horrors befell the same Cornish village, as far as we can tell.